Hey everyone, my name is Tegan and welcome back to Tandy Writes. Recently I saw Shailen Wright, who is one of my favourite bookish YouTube creators by the way, post a video reacting to the dystopian they wrote when they were 13 and I was painfully reminded of my first attempt at a novel that still lives in my Dropbox files. So today we're going to be reacting to the dystopian novel that I attempted to write when I was 12 in 2013 and the only reason I can remember the year is because I submitted the first chapter as a short story to my local writers group and I won an award in my age category for it. The prize for this was an advanced copy of The Strange and Beautiful Stories of Ava Lavender, which is still sitting on my shelves unread to this day because I am just that bad at reading new books. Without opening up the Word document, the story is about a young teenager called Lorali who begins the book in what I remember to be some kind of psych ward or facility for special people because she hears voices. A mysterious woman burns it to the ground and Lorali escapes with her roommates to track down the woman and identify the source of all the voices in the head. They travel on foot across the country, which takes them a week to get to the capital city, which is the only city due to my paper thin world building, and intend to blend in with some refugees to sneak in and confront the government, I think? I do not remember the logistics of the plan 11 years later, but we'll soon find out. I also keep thinking that this is a dystopian novel, but I think it's more of a post-apocalyptic adventure, and I definitely spent more time crafting the characters on IMVU than actually deciding what the apocalypse was. Maybe that is dystopian. The implication is that the apocalypse was due to some kind of plague or disease to my memory, but I did not explore that at all on page. It is also set in North America, but was in my preteen mind influenced by the media of the early 2010s. That was the only place an apocalypse could happen. It was 2013, so obviously I was writing in the imitation of a dystopian novel. This would have been my first attempt at any kind of long form fiction to my memory, because I think that everything came before was abandoned first chapters or fan fiction websites and just the overall desire to write something someday. But the reason I made a notable amount of progress on this story in comparison to my previous tries was because the first chapter or two are basically an account of a nightmare that I had that still haunts me to this day and I can remember it so vividly that when I woke up that I could write it down with no effort. It was also the first and only time I've woken up from a dream, fallen back asleep and then had the dream continue from exactly where it left off. At this age, there's nothing I love more than an excessive number of adjectives or adverbs. In English lessons at school, I remember that the bulk of our creative writing focused on scenery descriptions while we learned about simile and metaphor and pathetic fallacy and all that. And I think I must have been praised for my description because that seems to be all that I understood how to write. So the prologue. The flaming orb of the sun was gradually sinking below the sand-coated horizon, shooting an array of purple and red to dance across the sky as it became darker. A wax-white smile of the moon took its place in the blanket of black amongst a family of millions of stars. The temperature rapidly plummeted as the remaining stray beams of light from the sun were tamed. Two figures stepped forward. Dramatic, right? Waxed white is a phase that came into my vocabulary a year or so before writing this and it appeared in every single piece of description I ever wrote. I still whip it out on occasion now. There was no security needed inside the building. After all, the building was placed at the edge of a desert a mile away from the forests and plains. You can tell that at age 12 I had no concept of distance or geography. The extent of my geographical knowledge came from Minecraft biomes and I now know that a mile is really not that far. It's not remote, it's not isolated, it's a third of the length of my daily walk. It's definitely not far away enough from any kind of civilization to have a kind of prison that doesn't have security. The mysterious pair melted into the shadows while the nurse checked the names of the patients off the clipboard. She stood still and confused, trying to match the updated room number to the patients from memory. Everyone had been moved around to have a change of scenery a week before, and no one had decided to correct the list. So 12 year olds have no concept of how a medical prison hybrid facility works. Also, this prologue got added a while after I wrote the first few chapters book, because I was somehow convinced that every good book had to have a prologue, which is just simply incorrect. I don't think these characters ever return to the page. Creeping forward, the man wrapped his hands around her neck, pushing her to the floor and squeezing until she was choking and gasping for air. So my fixation with writing about murder has been ever-present, apparently. There's not much else to say about this prologue, so we'll move on to the next chapter, and I'll try to be more concise with quotes now that I've set the vibe with what we're working with. Chapter 1. Our main character, Laurelie, is cold and shivering in bed. Her breath is shaking and her heartbeat is racing for reasons we do not know. Her new roommate, Lucas, is sleeping peacefully across the room just close enough to distinguish the trembling, whispered words in his nightmare from his gentle snores. I just because of my passion, clearly. There's a paragraph describing the cell they're living in and Laurelie Sands fall asleep while thinking about the day of extensive therapy she has ahead, and I am cringing internally so hard at this next paragraph that I do not want to read it, but I will, for the plot. 
I couldn't wait to be free of those dreaded voices, they had slowly tempted me into becoming insane, murderous, and suicidal. This suggestion of a character backstory is something that we also do not return to at any point, because I did read books at that age but I did not read frequently or widely enough to truly understand narrative structure or how to craft a story outside of putting words on the page. I also wanted to write about dark subject matter because I thought I was cool and edgy and emo at age 12, and those were the kind of qualities that would make me stand out. The next few paragraphs go into Laura Lee hearing footsteps in the hallway outside of the room and wondering if the sound is real or hallucinated. She notes that it sounds like a person's wearing high heels and therefore they must be an outsider as the hospital staff only wear flat shoes. She hears a door down the hall creak open as a voice in her head tells her to leave all she can, which she ignores. She starts having what I think I'm trying to describe as a panic attack, then someone screams. There's now an unexplainable time jump of a few hours, Laura Lee is suddenly waking up just before sunrise. The previous locked door to her room is wide open, she hears the footsteps having passed as if no time has passed at all. The other character who is mentioned in the prologue also walks past, pauses in her doorway, and she says hello to him because he looks friendly. She falls asleep. Another time jump, the sun is rising, her roommate Lucas is yelling at her to wake up, and all Laura Lee can think about is how hot the room is and that Lucas looks unearthly and beautiful like a true YA potential love interest he is. The building is on fire and I decide to flex that I vaguely know how to act in a burning building by throwing it into this paragraph. Remember that smoke rises, everyone get low, cover your face, I don't actually know if any of this is factually correct. Every noun in this paragraph has an adjective, every verb has an adverb. Descriptive writing is both my passion and my nemesis. They break out of the room and run down the hallway together and a voice tells Laurie to stop running and turn around against all common sense. A creepy girl with blood red lips and coal black eyes and paper white skin, because what else would she look like? Grabs her arm and screams, Luke drags her away as her ear-piercing scream echoed with the voices within me. And that is where the title comes from and the first chapter ends. My first dream or nightmare ended there. I woke up, wondered if there was something seriously wrong with me, then fell us back asleep for the dream sequel that became chapter two. Laura Lee also must have passed out at this point because the second chapter begins with her waking up in a new location, which is an abandoned schoolroom on hospital property, and we are confronted with some of the war. A couple of centuries ago, after all the people had fled to the cities after the war, the hospital had been used as an actual hospital. A town has stretched for the now empty mile between the hospital and the edge of the desert, Children too sick to go to any of the regular schools had to take lessons here. My first attempt at world building, please bask in the glory. I feel like I'm now resurrecting a long buried memory and I think the war is something I mentioned again at the end of the book but I don't think it has any development other than just being a generic war. Somehow it turned the world into a wasteland and everything that wasn't a city disappeared. This feels like divergent, in a sense. Laurie and Lucas are hanging out in the schoolroom and Lucas sees a person fleeing the burning hospital. They enter the schoolroom and is immediately knocked out. He didn't look too dangerous. Well, that was what I thought back then. Now I know the truth. I wish I also knew the truth because I have no memory of how this man remains relevant to the plot. He wakes up, reveals that he is a doctor who had been working the night shift at a hospital in a vaguely nearby city when he saw the mysterious strangers walking around. He assumed he was imagining things until he heard a scream and then he ran outside. The hospital erupted into flames and then he just hung around outside and slept through the fire instead of helping save any of the patients. The entire city also manages to fall into ruin. He finds a scrap of paper floating around in the breeze like a snow white but slightly grubby butterfly that has the hospital's address, a date, and Laura Lee's name, and then must have decided that this stranger was someone he wanted to save so he came as fast as he could. In the next scene I introduce the theme of demonic possession and I honestly don't even know where to begin with this one because I once again can't remember if we readdress this topic. A lore dump through a mysterious book found by the main characters is something I still do to this day. I also throw in the map around here and I hope you can tell that this is vaguely America shaped and I almost definitely drew it and added the lines in Microsoft PowerPoint or whatever the knockoff open office version is. Graphic design, unlike world building, is my passion. Valsan is the city that was just attacked and Roscoff is the place we're currently in, so we come to the conclusion that something is going to happen in the third and final place corrects which is apparently where the remains of the government are located. It's not discussed on page, but I think Laura Lee and Lucas decide to travel to Coretz and maybe warn the government about an incoming threat, but only maybe. My grasp on the plot is a mere thread at best, so thankfully that is the end of chapter two and the end of revisiting this book for now, unless there is a demand for me to continue. I think the two original chapters are more than enough for me to handle today. The following chapters are about Laura Lee and Lucas's journey to the capital. They get separated along the way because he's injured at some point during the fire and another group of travellers they encounter take him to their refugee camp. 
she meets a really cool girl who helps smuggle her into the government building, and I say government building because that is the only thing this city consists of. Lori discovers that her older estranged brother is leading the government and the building is where they experiment on people, and the voices she hears are his mind control. And then she blows up the building. The end. All of my books seem to end in flame. One final fun fact about this book is that it was also my first attempt to curate a writing playlist, and it consisted of two songs I played on repeat, Laura Palmer and Things We Lost in the Fire, both by Bastille. And the version of Laura Palmer I've listened to was a YouTube download which had the dogs barking in the middle, you know, to prevent you from downloading it. I also spent a lot of time researching the perfect Minecraft seeds so I could build this world and the government building is just a glass tower floating on top of a random perfect circle lake I found. It's truly high art. So that is all I can handle for this video today. Maybe I'll revisit the story in the future and expose more of the chapters. Maybe I'll delete it from my Dropbox forever. Either way, thank you so much for watching this video and I hope to see you next time. Bye.